tonight I want to uh, just share with you how many sitting here have never heard me tell my story. Could I see your hand? Oh, so many of you. My goodness, I thought maybe all of you had heard. Well, then I must give it tonight, and I trust that the Lord will really bless it to your heart. Uh, the scripture that I want to read is the 13th chapter of Luke, at the 10th verse. This is my very favorite scripture while I was sick and crippled, because it's a picture of what I was exactly before the Lord came and set me free. And one day when Mama read this scripture to me, I said, read it again. That little woman is just like me. And Mama said, yes. And what Jesus did for her, he'll do for you. The 13th chapter of Luke, the 10th verse, and he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years, and she was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence tonight, and we thank you for this uh, privilege and, oppor uh, and opportunity we have to gather together with our friends to worship you. I ask you, Lord, now that one more time you bless this story as you've blessed it so many times before. I pray, Lord, tonight that men and women may see Jesus as they've never quite seen you before. Walk among these aisles, speaking to every heart and meeting every need. If there should be one in this service that came in this service tonight that does not know you as a savior i pray they'll not leave without accepting you as their lord and savior those that have come tonight and have uh, needs in their body that are sick and afflicted maybe the terminal maybe doctors have said there's no hope i pray lord that you'd reach out your hand and touch them with your power and bring healing to their bodies i pray lord that you'd bless us tonight and make us a blessing, and we'll be careful to praise you, for we ask it in Jesus' name, and all the people said, amen. I can never remember the time in my life of ever being well and healthy and strong and normal like other boys and girls. My childhood memories are of sickness, disease, doctors and hospitals, and much pain in my body. Right after I was born, doctors told my parents I could not live. I was born with every vertebrae in my spine out of place, the bones twisted and matted together. I was born with my heart enlarged nearly twice its normal size. Oxygen was kept in my room. I had to have it several hours, day and night to be able to breathe. When I got to the age where you start giving a baby solid food, mama started giving me food. Immediately I would reject it. It would come up. I could keep no solid food down. They put me in the hospital, did further testing and found I was born with all the organs in my stomach dropped and out of place. One kidney not functioning, the other filled with stones. So I could never eat and digest solid food. I lived on milk and fruit juice and fed through the veins till the Lord healed me. I, as I got older, I was given hypos and painkillers from the time I was just a baby, and the dosage increased stronger as I got older. But the pain, of course, as I got older and got worse, the pain got worse in my body. At the age of nine, I heard about Jesus and accepted him as my Savior, and he actually changed my life because he became very precious to me, and he was my closest and dearest friend. But at the age of 11, I was having so many heart attacks, and the pain was so great. And the doctor said, I've done everything I can do, and yet I've got to take away those strong painkillers because of the condition of her heart. There's one more hospital I want to send her to. I've been in and out of hospitals and had so many specialists. He said they actually won't be able to help her, but at least maybe they can give her something that will ease the pain she's suffering. So one blizzardy, stormy night in the state of Minnesota, mommy in the ambulance with me, they took me this, to this great hospital where they say they have the finest specialists that can be found anywhere. I was kept in this hospital over three weeks, nearly four weeks I was there. I had a different specialist for every part of my body. They were constantly x-raying, doing tests, taking scans, and during those weeks in that hospital, it's like a nightmare to me. In fact, so bad that you could hardly ever get me in a hospital. The only way I ever go in a hospital is if someone is dying in intensive care and they've requested Betty Baxter to come. With much fear and trembling, I will go to see them. But the moment I step in a hospital, 
hospital, all the nightmare feeling of those years as a child comes back on me again. As I suffered such extreme pain and went through so much during those weeks in that hospital. But one day the head doctor came in and said, I've got a surprise for you. I've called your hometown. The ambulance is on his way. Your daddy's with them. And I'm going to send you home. I was excited and thrilled. I was 11 years of age. And I thought he's kept me this long and now he's sending me home. I'm going home to live and to get well. So I was excited. The ambulance came. They put me on the stretcher, strapped me to the stretcher and pushed me to the elevator to take me to first floor. Daddy was with the ambulance. He was standing beside the stretcher. When the doctor came up and said, Mr. Baxter, I want to talk to you before you leave. And daddy said, all right. He pointed as his line on the stretcher and said, tell me, how much does a child know about her sickness? And daddy said, she knows as much as we do ever since a child, ever since a baby, we've told her everything doctors have told us. And the doctor said, then it's all right to talk in front of her. And daddy said, sure. And lying there 11 years of age, quickly, I thought he's going to tell daddy now about some kind of miracle medicine that's going to make me well. And when the doctor started talking, I could not believe I was hearing right. I heard that doctor say, we have here the finest specialists that can be found anywhere. We've done everything possible that there is nothing more medical science can do for her. He said to my daddy, don't try another hospital. Don't try another specialist. There's nothing that can be done. She has but a short time left to live. Take her home and keep her as happy as possible. I was 11 years of age and I was terminal, sent home to die. I started to cry and I closed my eyes, not knowing that the tears rolled down my face anyway. They put me in the ambulance, gave me oxygen and carried me to my home and carried me into the room where I'd spent my life. Lying in bed, weeping, crying and oppressed and depressed and feeling sorry for my myself. I said, Jesus, you heard what the doctor said. He said, I'm going to die. So if I'm going to die anyway, let me die right now. I don't want to suffer one more night of this pain. As I travel across the United States and around the world, every time I tell my story, I have a healing line. When I walk by to touch the people, a man or a woman will look at me and say, Betty, I'm terminal. And immediately I know the feeling that you have, the feeling of frustration, the feeling of hopelessness, knowing there's nothing more that can be done for you. I know and experience what that feeling is. And especially you have it. If you don't know about divine healing and you don't know Jesus heals today. You see, while we were little children, mama said to us, if you ever want to know anything about God, you ask a pastor. He lives next to God. He knows everything. And so when every doctor said I was dying, I asked to see the pastor. When he came to my bedside, he said, you wanted to see me? I said, yes, sir. I said, you remember when I got saved? He said, such a wonderful conversion. I'll never forget it. I said, well, that day you told us the story of Jesus and you said he healed all kinds of sickness, even cripples like me. And he said, that's right. I did tell that story and he did heal all kinds of sickness. I said, then pastor, every doctor daddy says, takes me to says, I'm dying. He said, I know it. And I'm sorry. I said, then do you reckon if I coax Jesus real hard and begged him, do you reckon he would heal? heal me. Perhaps it's the hardest question that pastor ever had to answer. With tears in his eyes, he took my hand and said, Betty, I can't give you false hope, but the days of miracles are past and gone. Jesus doesn't heal like that anymore. So you see, if you're sent home to die and you don't know Jesus heals, you're indeed without any hope at all. So I was lying there with no hope at all, weeping and crying when mama came in the room. She leaned over the bed and she said, my my, why all the tears? Aren't you happy to be back home with mom again? I said, I'm happy to be back home but you don't know what the doctor told my daddy. She said, of course, I know what he said. He said, what every doctor has said, she said, you were a baby. He said, you were going to die. But she said, you're not going to die because I found the answer. Well, I thought mama had found another doctor. So I looked at her and said, mama, what is his name? And she said, his name is Jesus. And I said, but mama, pastor said he doesn't heal anymore. And mama said, but there's one thing that goes beyond the word of a pastor. And that's the word of God. And she said, 
She said, while you were in the hospital, I grew desperate. And I began to read the New Testament over and over again. And I found a scripture there that pastors never found. It says, all things are possible if you can only believe. I found another scripture that says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means just as he healed when he's alive and walked the shores of Galilee. He's still healing today. He's going to go on healing until he comes in the clouds of glory. Well, I got so excited. Did you get excited when you heard Jesus could heal? I got so excited. I forgot all about wanting to die. I was somewhere on cloud nine believing with mama that Jesus would actually come and heal my body. But the strangest thing happened when I determined to trust God with mama for healing. I grew worse instead of better. Has ever happened to you? I got worse. My chest sunk in. I, my body began to curve more and more, and I bent and bent until at the age of 15 when they stood me up. I stood only as high as my four-year-old baby brother. I faced him face to face. My body was completely curved and bent over. Large knots grew up and down my spine. The first at the base of my neck, one after the other, the last at the base of my spine. My arms were paralyzed from my shoulders to my wrists. I could only move my fingers. My head twisted on my body like this and paralyzed. I could not move my head. But in this condition, my mother still, with faith in God stood on that scripture. All things are possible if you can only believe. Even when our pastor did not believe, our church did not believe, daddy certainly did not believe, our family did not believe, mama stood on the word of God. And I challenge you this this evening, get a scripture and quote it on and on and on and stand on it and tell God you believe it and get it in your spirit, in your soul, and you will receive healing for your body. We kept trusting God. My grandmother came to see me. And the excitement of seeing someone different, I had a severe heart attack. So the doctor said, if I want to keep the child alive, she can't have company. So he isolated me from the world. I could see only three people, mama, daddy, and the doctor. And this is the loneliest time of all my life. Because by personality, I'm not a loner. I do not enjoy long periods of time alone. I like friends with me. I like family around me. And this is such a lonely time. Mama would bathe me every morning. And then she'd put me on one side of the bed. And I was so bent that lying in bed, when you'd put me on one side, my head would nearly touch my knees. I was so bent and curved. And she would put me on one side of the bed, and I knew I'd have to stay in that position till she'd come to turn me on the other side. There was nothing I could do to pass away the time. I had no toys because I had no use for toys. I could not play with them. I couldn't read to pass away the time. My arms are dead, paralyzed at my side. I couldn't hold the book to read. And just as a child during those years of loneliness, I began to talk to the Lord. And I can't count or number the times as I'd be softly talking to the Lord. I'd hear soft sound at the side of my bed and wonder if mom would come back in the room and I didn't hear open or close the door. And then I'd hear a soft voice call me by my first name three times. The voice would call softly Betty. The first time he spoke my name, I knew immediately it was not the voice of Dr. Bailey. I knew it was not the voice of my daddy, but I knew immediately it was the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ calling me by my name. You say, Betty, you mean you've actually audibly heard the voice of Jesus? I've heard his voice as clear and plain and audible as you hear in mine tonight. There are many things he said to me, but one thing he always told me each time he came to visit because he knew it was the one thing I longed to hear most. I never felt anybody really love me. My daddy was good, but he could not handle sickness. And so in the morning, daddy would come in, kiss me on the forehead and say, good morning, daddy must go to work. At night, he came home, kissed me again, said, good night, daddy must go to to my bed. And so that's about the, once in a while, he would come and hold me in his arms. But my dad could not handle being around someone sick and crippled like I was. So the only one I had actually was my mother. And I felt she loved me. And then there were times I wondered, does she love me? Or does she take care of me because I belong to her? So I always had this insecure feeling of not knowing if anybody really loved me. So each time Jesus came to visit, 
he would softly say he loved me. And when he said he loved me, a thrill would pass through me. My heart would beat faster and I think I can go on being ugly and twisted if Jesus loves me. I can go on being alone because I felt then still like I feel tonight. If you've got Christ, you've got it all. If you have Jesus in your life, you have everything. And then Jesus said, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll be with you always even unto the end. Time went by and I grew worse and weaker in my body. And one evening, Mama said, after she'd fed the family and cleaned the kitchen, she came into my room. The sun was just going down. And she said, I was unconscious. I was breathing hard and loud and fast. She said, she sat by my bed and watched and listened as I labored for every breath of air that kept me alive. She said she'd been sitting there for a while, and all at once there was complete silence in the room. She could hear no more breathing. She got up and tried to find a pulse beat somewhere, but could find none. She said there was a gurgling sound in my throat and fluid coming from my mouth. She picked up my hands. My fingernails were black, and my lips were blue. Frightened, she went to the telephone, called Dr. Bailey, and said, you must come at once. Something's wrong with Betty. She's not breathing right, and she looks strange and the doctor said I'll be there when he came after he examined my unconscious body and straightened up mama said what's wrong with her why does she look like this why is she breathing so strange and the doctor said she's lived now past the time we said she could but this is it she will never regain consciousness again in this unconscious state she's going to die if there's anyone you want to call while she's still alive and breathing you must call them at once someone sit with her day and night at the slightest change call me and i'll be here so my grandparents came to my room aunts and uncles came neighbors came and church people gathered in my room for four days and nights i was lying there unconscious to this world knowing nothing and no one the doctor came morning and afternoon, and each day he would say as he examined me, it can't be long now. She's getting weaker. Everyone in that room, my daddy included, were waiting for me to die. But even then, Mama didn't give up her faith in God. She didn't eat, but she fasted and prayed that I would not die, but that God would heal me and give me back to her again. The fifth morning, I did what the doctor said I'd never do. But doctors aren't always right. Oftentimes they're wrong if you have Jesus in on your case. The fifth morning I became conscious. Mama could tell by my eyes I was conscious. She shook me very hard and said, Betty, it's Mama. Don't you know me? It's Mother. Don't you know me? I tried so hard to speak to Mama, but I was so weak no words would come. So I smiled and let Mama know I was conscious and that I knew her. When I smiled and my mother knew I was conscious, she raised both hands and began to praise God. Tears rolling down her cheeks, she began to praise God because she felt God had answered her prayer and given me back to her again. But as I saw Mama standing there with upraised arms, praising God above everyone in the whole world. I love my mother best of all. She's all that I had since a baby. She had her bed in the same room with mine. And through the years, if I wanted anything night or day, Mama was at my bedside. I loved her best of all. The pain was so severe throughout my entire body that when I saw my mother standing there praising God, I thought if I should die, Mama would miss me. But just for a little while at first, and then she'd soon get used to me being gone. And if I was gone, she could go places with Daddy like she's not able to do. And I know that if I were to die, I'd be better off. Because for the last several months, every time Mama had time to sit by my bed, she'd say, I've got time to tell you a story. What would you like to hear? My answer was always the same. Please, Mama, tell me again about that place of many mansions. I never got tired of hearing Mama tell of the splendors of heaven. Mama said there's a land that is fairer than day, and that by faith we can see it afar. Mama said the Father waits over the way, that there's gates of pearl, walls of jasper, and streets of solid gold. And Mama said the best thing about heaven, there are no cripples in that land. Everybody will walk tall and straight on the streets of gold. All pain is gone forever. Do you blame me that I long to go to that place where for the first time in my life I'd be free from the pain I suffered and so closing my eyes tightly as mama had taught us to when we prayed that day I actually prayed to die I said Jesus for a long time mama and I've trusted you to heal me 
I don't know why you haven't, but it's all right if you don't want to. But please, Jesus, if you're not going to heal me, please come and take me to that land mama's told me about. And as I prayed to die, thick black darkness settled about my bed. They'd never, ever left me in a dark room alone before. Always there was a light burning, and mama or daddy, one was always with me. But alone in the darkness, I became frightened. And when I was frightened, the first thing I thought of was my big, strong daddy. And frightened, I whispered, daddy. Where is my daddy? I want my daddy. Listen to me. I've been at death's door. I know what it feels like. Listen to me tonight. At death's door, even though you know Jesus, the first feeling is a fear of the unknown because you don't know what it's all about. And if fear grips you, and if you're young enough when death comes to you, you will long for your mother and dad. Many of you along for husband and wife, you've always had them. But in that hour of death, there's only one that's able to go beyond the veil of death with you. And that one is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's the only one. I called for daddy, but he didn't come. And right in front of me, it appeared and looked like a long, dark, narrow-looking valley. In a floating sensation, my crippled body floated just inside that valley. It was worse inside the valley than out. It was not only very dark, but it was so very cold. And I shivered and shook and trembled. And I was so cold, my teeth chattered. And now I'm really scared. And in a scared whisper, I whispered, where am I? What is this awful place? And from somewhere far, far in the distance, I recognized and heard my mother's voice saying softly, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I said, that's right. I prayed to go to Jesus. And if this is the way that gets me to Jesus, I'm willing to go. But I was barely inside that valley when all at once that valley lit up with the light, light of the day. Because where Jesus is, there can be no darkness. He's the light of the world. He will light this dark valley for the Christian. Somebody's big, strong hand took mine and squeezed it. I didn't need to look. I knew it was not the strong hand of Dr. Bailey. I knew it was not the big hand of my daddy. I knew it that look is the nail-scarred hand of Jesus who said he'd never leave me. He'd be with me always, even unto the end. He held tightly to my hand. In the distance, I heard the most beautiful music I've ever heard in my life. And then I came out and saw the most beautiful land I've ever seen. And separating from this beautiful place was a wide, wide river. And the waves are tossing and rolling angrily against the shore. Some call this Jordan's River. Some call it the River of Death. I looked on the other side and saw the most beautiful land. Flowers blooming of every color. Flowers that will never fade or die because that's heaven. And winding its way through that land was the River of Life. Because it's a land where we'll never grow old. And then standing just across the river from me, waiting to welcome me across where a group of those have been saved by the same Christ that had saved me, dressed in flowing garments of purest white that fell about their feet, they stood. And with arms of praise together, they swang, sang in sweet harmony, holy, holy, holy. I looked at one and not a single one was bent and bowed and twisted like my body was. I looked at another one, not a single one had arms that were useless, dead, and paralyzed at their side like mine. I looked at still another one, and not a one was crying because of pain or burdens too heavy for them to bear. I said, just a few moments, I'm going to join that heavenly band. The moment I step across the river, I'll straighten up and have a new body, and I'm going to run all over God's heaven. I was anxious to get on the other side. If you lost a loved one, don't ever wish them to be back here. They would never want to return to this earth after seeing that beautiful place. I was anxious to cross when Jesus, standing beside me, audibly, softly spoken, said, No, Betty, you'll not cross. Go back. I'll heal you in the fall. In the months and years before, I trusted his word like you're trusting his word. But at this moment in time, he promised me from his lips he would heal me in the fall. This experience happened in the early part of March. And after this experience, I went into a coma. And I was in that coma from March until, until August. And many people have come to me prayer for young people that have had car accidents in comas. And they say, well, he's brain dead. He's been in a coma so many months. So what? That has nothing to do with God's power to heal. It's nothing to do with God's power to heal. I was lying in this coma, getting worse, weaker every day. The doctor said she will never come out of the coma. If she does, she will be a vegetable. But after I was healed, 
Daddy told me those months I was lying in that coma. Then in the middle of the night, he'd hear someone talking. He'd hear noise. He said he'd come to my room, and there Mama would be kneeling at my bed, praying and reading God's word over my unconscious body lying there in the coma. She didn't ever give up hope. She didn't ever lose her faith. She had faith in God that he would do exactly as he said he would. Listen, you don't have to know all about prophecy to be healed. You don't have to know all about healing to be healed. All you have to do is get a hold of one scripture and stand up and repeat it. And I tell you what, healing will come to you because that's all my mother knew to do. One day, I became conscious and I wasn't a vegetable. My mind was as keen then as it is right now. I felt again the horrible pain throughout my body. Mama was sitting by my bed. My lips moved because I noticed it was hot. They could never get clothes on me. If they took me anywhere, Mama wrapped me in claws and pinned them down the side. And lying in bed, if it was cold weather, she put something warm across me. If it was hot weather, she put very something very light. And the last thing I remember, the first of March in Minnesota was very cold. And now it's warm and there's a big fan in my room. And I'm perplexed because why is it hot now? The last thing I remembered is cold weather. My lips moved and Mama seeing my lips move, put her ear down to my lips. And in a weak whisper, all that I could speak before I was healed was just a whisper. I whispered and said, what day is today? And Mama smiled at me and said, it's the 14th day of August. So then I knew how many months I had lost in between. I whispered and said, I want to sit in my big chair. And ever since a very little girl, they kept a large overstuffed chair in my room, propped high with pillows. If I wanted to be out of the bed, they would pick me up, put me on the pillows with my head resting on my knees and my arms at my side. And this is the only way I could sit in the chair. If you've been one of those to pass through my room as many did before I was healed, you could have seen and counted every knot up and down my spine. Daddy was in the room. He was crying like a child. When I whispered, I'd like to sit in my chair, he picked me up put me on the pillows in the big chair, and then he and Mama sit on the floor to look in my face. Again, I whispered and said, you must leave. I have to be alone. I heard them cry as they left the, they left the room because they knew I hated to be alone. The only time I ever asked to be alone is when I had an appointment with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You can get an appointment with Jesus in the hour of the day or night. He's never too busy to take time to talk to you. He never leaves heaven to go on a vacation. And I've never called heaven and got an answering machine. You reached heaven. No one in. Leave your name and number. We'll get back with you. No, he's always on the line. His line's never busy. He's always on that line. And you can get an audience with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I heard them close the room, close the door of the room, and knew I was alone. Tears streamed down my cheeks. I'm skin stretched over bones. I am dying. The doctor said my heart was deteriorating till I would die of heart failure. And sitting there in that chair all my life, they had told me I would die, and I didn't ever believe them. But that day, I knew I was dying. I knew I could not go on living in this condition. And then I remembered what Mama said. She told me it was God's will to heal the people. Did you hear me? If you're praying, if it be thy will, you're praying in doubt. Because it's God's will to heal the people. Mama said the devil came to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus came to give life and more abundant life. And you can't have abundant life if you're sick. So it's the devil that's brought sickness to you. But Jesus wants to give you abundant life in good health tonight. So I sit there and got so angry at the devil. I thought, he's killing me. I haven't lived. I haven't left this room except to go to a hospital or a clinic or a doctor. I haven't gone anywhere. I've lived in this one room, and now I'm going to die without ever doing anything, seeing everything, anything except this one room. And the devil's responsible for it. I grew so angry with him. And then I thought of that day at the river when Jesus said, go back. I'll heal you in the fall. So quickly I closed my eyes and said, Lord, remember when I almost got to heaven, you wouldn't let me cross the river. You said to go back, that you'd heal me in the fall. I said, it's still awful hot here, Lord. So I don't reckon you really call this fall yet, do you, Lord? But for this one year, would you call it fall and come and heal me? Listen, he'll change the times and the seasons for his children if he so desires, won't he? And when I pray and ask God for something and really want to answer, I go very still and quiet and I wait to listen for him to answer me back. He's alive. 
He's up there. He hears me when I pray. And he has the power to answer me. You say, Betty, did God speak to people today? Certainly. And the most common way he speaks to us is through his word. How often you've been going through a trial, you could not take one more step. You begin to read the word of God and a verse leaped from the pages and gripped you, became rhema alive. There was God talking to you through his word. He speaks in that sure, still inner witness that you know, that you know, that you know. And he could also speak in an audible voice if he so desires. But I sit there trembling. I got no scripture at all, nothing. I had no inner witness. I heard no audible voice. I got nothing that day. There'll come a time in your life when you will pray for something and really need an answer and you'll get nothing. You say, then, Betty, what do I do? Do like I did. Hang in there and ask again. It said, ask and you shall receive. It said, seek you and find. It said, knock and it shall be, shall be opened. But then sitting there, I began to think at the way I'd been praying. If you prayed for something for a long time and haven't got an answer, check at the way you've been praying. Did you know you can pray wrong? And not get an answer. You pray with the wrong motive, you won't get an answer. And I checked the way I've been praying. And ever since the age of 11, when mama said Jesus could heal me, I prayed one way. It wasn't correct. It wasn't scriptural. It wasn't right. But we didn't know any better. I heard nothing about healing. I didn't have, mama read no books to me about healing. I heard no dates about healing. I heard no sermons about healing. All I knew was what mama told me. And that was that one verse. That all things are possible. If you can only believe. So I prayed wrong. Those years, every prayer was the same. I begged him to heal me. I pleaded. I begged. That is a scriptural healing is a gift. He paid the price at Calvary. He took the beating and bore the stripes. And with those stripes, we are healed. So healing's a gift. But I didn't know that. So I begged him. And I pleaded with him to heal me. But not one time. And all that that time had I told the Lord I'd give him anything or do anything for him. And I felt so selfish sitting there. Immediately I thought, what do I have that I could give Jesus? If you really want to give Jesus something, you go to your basement, your garage, you're upstairs somewhere, have a, have a sidewalk sale or a garage sale and, and get a few quarters at least. So what did I have to give him? I was a child, a very immature child who lived my life in one room alone. So the first thought I had was toys. I wish I had, had toys because if I had toys, I'd give them all to Jesus. I didn't stop to wonder what he would do with toys. But aren't you glad he saw the motive of my heart? I wanted to give something. But I had no toys to give. And then I thought of my sisters. They had two pairs of shoes. One for school, a prettier pair for church. I didn't ever have any. And when I begged Daddy for shoes, he held me in his arms with tears in his eyes. He said, there's no money for you shoes. And if Daddy got you shoes, what would you do with them? You have no use for shoes. So I had no shoes to give Jesus. And then the one thing I'd wanted ever since I was a very little girl, I had one dream in life. If I slept, I dreamed about it. If I was awake, I thought about it. And that was to someday have a dress of my very own that was mine. It was the greatest desire of my heart. You can't even imagine the obsession I had to have a dress of my own. So sitting there trembling, I whispered, Jesus, as much as I want to dress, I wish I had one. Because if I had one, I'd give it to you, and you could have it. And to me, that day as a little girl, that was the ultimate sacrifice I made to be willing to give that dress away if I had it, but I had no dress to give. And as I thought, there was only one thing I had in life. Most people have more than one thing. I only had one thing that, I, that belonged to me. It wasn't much. But it was all that I had. And I found out if we'll give him our all, he'll take it and use it for his glory. The only thing I had in this life was a twisted, ugly, paralyzed, deformed body. But closing my eyes tight, I said, Jesus, listen to me, and I'll tell you what I'll do. If you'll heal the organs in my stomach and put them in their proper place so I can eat and digest solid food and gain strength, I'll use all that strength for your service. If you'll heal my heart, 
and give me a brand new strong heart. I'll use that strong heart for you. I said, Jesus, I'll go further than that. If you heal me on the inside, if you heal me on the outside and make me perfectly whole from this day on, my life will no longer belong to Betty Baxter, but I'll be yours and I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll be what you want me to be. That's the promise I made for the healing that I have tonight. If you've tried everything else, try commitment. And ooh, in the States, they don't like that word. Christians in the States don't like that word commitment. To be willing to tell the Lord you'll do anything for him. Because you're scared to death where he'll ask you to go. What he'll ask you to do tonight. You're scared to death. Try commitment. I promised him my life and I meant it. I vowed it to him. I've been going to a church in Ohio. For five years I went. And five years ago at the age of 20 when I first went. There's a boy was riding a most motorcycle without a helmet, and he hit head-on with a semi-truck. It severed his spinal, spinal cord, so he's paralyzed from here down. So every year I go, he sits midway in the middle section in the wheelchair, and every year I pray for him. I feel no faith, nothing from him. So the last time I went, after I prayed for the line, I walked back to him, and I said, what in the world are we going to do with you? This is five years. You were 20 when I first started coming. You're 25 now. You're still sitting like you, you were the first time I came. What are we going to do with you? He said, well, I hope tonight you'll heal me and get me out of this chair. I said, I cannot heal. Only Jesus can heal. But I said, let me tell you something. I know what we'll do. Would you be willing to tell the Lord that if he healed you so you could get out of the chair and run and walk and move your neck and move your arms and your feet and your legs and be perfectly normal, would you tell the Lord and mean it that you'd go wherever he wanted you to go? You'd do whatever he wanted you to do. You'd be whatever he wanted you to be. Would you make that commitment to the Lord? Would you make that promise? He looked at me astonished and said, Sister Betty, I can't do that. I said, why not? He said, the Lord might ask me to go somewhere I don't want to go. Now, that's true. But if he does, his grace is sufficient. There's places he asked me to go that I don't like to go. But when I get there, I find out his grace is sufficient. The first time I went to Calcutta, India, the sewer of the whole world, worse than any nation in the world, any city. And I preached that first night of the crusade for Mark Montaigne. I stayed in one of his apartments above the church. He said, now, Betty, don't be surprised. But tonight, if you see a rat in your room the size of a tomcat, because they never kill a rat because they believe in reincarnation. It could be somebody's grandmother. They come back in the form of a rat so they don't kill them. And they get as big as tomcats. After I got through preaching that night, I went to my room, found the highest high heel shoe I had. I sat on the foot of the bed all night long waiting. Listen, I'd have killed that rat if I'd have seen one, no matter whose grandma. It might have been. I was going to get rid of that rat. Yes. I don't like to go to India. There's places I don't like to go, but when I get there, his grace is sufficient. There's a place in Indonesia I go every year. I already know what the room is like. There's no mirrors in the room. There's no windows. I get ready for church with my little combat mirror like this trying to fix my hair. In one corner of the room is an eastern toilet. Do you know what an eastern toilet is? A hole in the floor. Then in another corner, there's a shower, Indonesia shower. You know what that is? A tank of ice cold water with a long handle dipper. And you just go, shh, shh. and when you're hot, that's just terrible. I'm so hot and sweaty, I come home, put that ice cold water on me, and you can hear me yell all over the place. And then on top of it, there's no bed, but there's a thin mat on the floor. And the strangest thing is happening to me. Every year, it's harder for me to get up from that mat the next morning. I don't claim to be getting old, but something's happened to me. It's hard for me to get off of that cement floor, that little thin mat. No, some of the places he asked me to go, I don't want to go. But his grace is sufficient. And I'd rather do that than be sitting all bent, bowed over, suffering pain, wouldn't you? So that boy still sits in that wheelchair because God might ask him to go somewhere he doesn't want to go. Try making a commitment. As I promised the Lord my life,
Beside the chair, I heard his audible voice. He spoke softly and said, Betty, I'm going to heal you completely. August the 24th, Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock. He gave me the hour, the day, and the time. Silent and strange, God knows all of our tomorrow's destiny. And the first thought I had was, won't Mama be tickled when I tell her? She thinks I'll be healed, but what is she going to say when I tell her I know the day and hour is going to do it? Then Jesus spoke and said, now don't tell this till my time comes. And sometime he shares with us, he wants us to keep still about it. How will I ever keep from telling Mama I never had a secret from her? I told her everything. But I found out how to keep a secret. You shut your mouth literally and don't open it. And then you won't tell. I heard Mama opening the door of the room. I shut my lips tight together. I wouldn't open my mouth one time for fear I'd let it slip in and tell her. She came and sat down on the floor so she could look up in my face. She talked to me about my family. She talked to me about my little brothers. Finally, she looked at me and said, Honey, do you know when the Lord's going to heal you? In all the years before when I didn't know, she hadn't asked me. And now when I knew and wasn't supposed to tell, she asked. I couldn't tell her. Jesus said not to. I just looked at her and said, When? She said, August the 24th, Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock. I said, Mama, how would you know that I let slip and tell you? She said, oh, no. The same God that talks to you, he talks to me too. And I knew that Jesus would heal me on the 24th day of August. So I could see that dream for a dress coming true. And I said, Mama, as bad as I am and as big as the knots are, you still believe he's going to do it? She said, I know he is because he never breaks a promise, and he never lies. I said, then, Mom, if you really believe it, don't wait. Go to town right now and get me a new dress and new shoes, and let's have them all ready when Sunday comes. So when I get healed at 3 o'clock, I can wear them and go to church on Sunday night. That's what I've been waiting for. I want you to think of the fantastic faith my mother had. No one in our family believed. And Daddy would get very angry with Mama if he ever came in my room and caught her praying for me. He would get very angry with her because he said she gave me false hope that will never come to pass. But Mama measured my crippled body and took my crooked feet and tried to straighten them on the palm of her hand to guess at what size shoe I would wear and what size dress. and went to town and got a new dress and shoes and brought them home. Lying bent over in bed, there was a place at the foot of the bed I could see all the time. She put the dress and the shoes. And I was never lonely after that. If they left me alone for hours, it made no difference. I looked at the dress and shoes for hours and think, won't I be pretty when Sunday comes? And Jesus heals me. And I'll be straight and walk and I'll have a dress and shoes and be just like other girls. The longest days of waiting have an ending. Weeping endures for a night, but there's joy coming in the morning. Your morning's almost here now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sunday came. My, the beginner teacher in Sunday school said that Sunday morning, my little four-year-old baby brother went in the beginner class. When they all got in, he raised his little hand. She said, what is it, Ross? He said, can I say something? She said, Sure. Said he got in front of the class and took out his handkerchief, wiped his eyes, and said, You all know my sis at home, don't you? Don't you? And they nodded their little heads. He said, Well, I just want to tell you, after church is over and I go home and eat my dinner, Jesus is coming to our house. He's going to make her bigger than me, and she's coming to church with me tonight. And he sat down. Well, the teacher said she felt so sorry for him. But you don't have to feel sorry for people who have faith in God. Mama said, I've got the chair in the living room. The family are all there. And some neighbors have come. And some church people have come. I said, Mama, do they all believe? She said, of course not. They've come to see. So Mama taught me about crowds. You can have a big crowd. That doesn't mean they're all believers. Many of them come to see. Mama carried me out and put me on the pillows in the big chair. My baby brother knelt beside the chair, and I don't know what you do when you get happy. I saw a woman not long ago at a mean that was paralyzed with a stroke get out of that wheelchair and kicked it back, and she began to scream and run up and down the aisles. She was so happy because God had healed her. And I don't know what you do if you dance, if you scream, if you yell, but when I get real happy, I cry real hard. And I was so happy it's time for Jesus to come. The tears are rolling down my face and my baby brother knelt at the chair. 
And he looked at my face. When he saw the tears, he shook his little head and said, don't cry anymore, sis. It'll only be a minute, then you'll be bigger than I am. Of all the people that Mama told, only my little brother believed. Do you need a prayer partner? Go to children's church and find you a child. They believe that Jesus will do exactly what he said he will do. Mama stooped down and said, it's time now for Jesus to come. Is there anything you want us to do before he comes? Remember, there's no pastor there. We asked him, but he wouldn't come. There's no evangelist there, no special person, as the world calls special. You don't have to have what the world calls special. All you need for a miracle is Jesus to be there. I thought we ought to pray, so I said, Mama, pray. We must be praying when he comes. And the last thing I remember was Mama praying, and she said, you promised at 3 o'clock you'd come and heal her. You're not a man that you would lie. You're not a man that you'd break a promise. Come now and heal her for your own glory. I didn't hear Mama praying anymore. I heard a great noise as if a storm was coming up. The wind was roaring, rushing, raging. Whoosh, through the living room went a rushing, mighty wind. The drapes swung in the breeze. A door slammed somewhere. And outside it was a steel quiet day. Everyone in the room heard the rushing mighty wind. It went through the living room and all was quiet. And I knew somehow the wind was bringing Jesus. I didn't know how he'd come from where, but I knew that wind was bringing. And in a whisper, all the louder could speak before I was healed. In the stillness, mama said, everyone heard me whisper, he's coming. Don't you hear him? He's coming at last. He's coming. Don't you hear him? And my head paralyzed on my knees. I could see that part of the living wall. I watched and waited. And I saw taking form across the room from me a great white fleecy cloud. No dark in it. No gray. Perfectly white. And as I watched the cloud stepping forth out of the cloud came Jesus. And T.L. Osborne has said, if you've ever seen the Lord, you'll never be the same again. I know this one. If you've ever seen Jesus, you're always longing to go home where you can look on his face. He walked slowly toward the chair. He was dressed in garments of glistening white. The robe glistened and shone that fell about his feet. His feet were bare except for sandals. His arms were outstretched toward me. He had light brown hair. That when the light would strike it, it would be gold. A short beard, mustache, but the most beautiful thing about Jesus are his eyes. No one's ever looked at me with love like Jesus did that day. And he walked slowly toward the chair, and he got to the side of it and stooped down. And he was so close to my chair, my arms didn't been paralyzed. I reached out and touched him. And he smiled, and so softly he spoke, Betty, you've been patient Kind and loving, and that repaid me for all I'd ever suffered. He said, henceforth, I'm going to promise you health, joy, and happiness. And those are the three greatest things in this life. Money cannot buy it, what he promised me. With the final word, happy, she reached out his hand. My body became tense, waiting for his touch. All at once inside, when a very hot feeling rushed through my body. Two hot hands, as hot as fire, took my organs and I felt him press on the lower part of my stomach, and I actually felt organs shift and move as they went into their proper place. I knew when they x-rayed me, everything would be in its proper place. I knew from that moment on you could give me anything to eat, and nothing would ever hurt me anymore. Two hot hands as hot as fire took my large heart and squeezed it. When he let it go for the first time in my life, I could take a deep breath without gasping, without any pain. And I knew that my heart trouble is gone. He's a heart specialist. He's a cancer specialist. He's an arthritis specialist. There's nothing impossible with the God we serve tonight. I knew that inside, I was healed completely. But my family and those there could see no change. I was still ugly twisted, paralyzed, crippled. I looked at Jesus quickly to see if he'd leave me half healed. But you remember this. When he begins something in your life, he will finish it. 
He smiled and reached out his hand. And on one of the large knots in the center of my spine, I felt a hand placed there I'd never felt before. A hand charged with the divine healing virtue of Jesus. A tingling sensation started in my crooked feet and tingled throughout my entire body. We heard the bones crack and plop as the vertebrae went into place. In the presence of my family and those who were there, they saw the knots fade and disappear and leave my spine. My head snapped back into its right position. My paralyzed arms were raised high. And in 10 seconds, I jumped from the chair and stood as straight as I'm standing. Tonight, I've been healed by the power of God. Hallelujah. You say, Betty, you mean instantly he healed you? I mean that. And when he instantly heals, that's called a miracle. But that's not the only way he heals. There is a healing. People get prayed for and they leave. Claiming God's promise. Standing on his word. Confessing the word. And over a period of time they get better and better and better. Till at last they're completely whole. That's called a healing. And in the Bible he healed instantly and gradually. As they went they were healed. So whether he heals instantly. Or gradually it makes no difference. As long as he gets it done right. But the greatest part of the whole story is this. It is no secret what God can do. What he's done for me, he'll do for you. He's no respecter of persons. Two weeks after I was healed, it was in my room. And I had a tremendous burden for young people in praying. And a light struck me in the face. I fell on the floor. And Mama heard me fall downstairs, came up to see what happened. She timed me for an hour and a half. I spoke in a language I'd never learned. And I became Pentecostal Nazarene two weeks after I was healed. At that time, he filled me with the Holy Spirit. Audibly, Jesus spoke to me and said, You promised if I healed you, you'd give me your life. I said, Yes, sir. He said, I want your teens. I told my parents what Jesus said. And Daddy said, Are you very sure that's what he said? I said, That's what he said to me. So daddy got a middle-aged school teacher, and I started traveling. I had school every day and preached somewhere every night. I thought the reason he wanted my teens was he was coming back right away. So I preached somewhere every night during those teen years. I would never have believed someone had they told me. that For years I'd preach and get married, have three children and four grandbabies, and still... Be telling the story and preaching. I wouldn't have believed it. I thought he was coming. But during those teen years, I saw a lot of miracles and won a lot of people to the Lord. While still a very young girl, I started traveling with Oral Roberts. And for 11 years, traveled with him. And each one of his means told this story I told you tonight. So I've been in every state of the Union, every province of Canada. And some 17 years ago in my quiet time, Jesus spoke audibly to me and said, you've kept your promise and your vow. And now just before my coming, I ask you to do one more thing. Leave the country you love best and the people who love you and go overseas and tell your story to someone who's never heard the name of Jesus. I would not think of disobeying. So for the last 17 or 18 years, at some part every year, I've spent overseas from two weeks to two months Then 12 years ago, my husband went on staff at the church in Singapore. So for these 12 years, I spend three months there and three months in the States and three months back there. So I'm spending six months overseas each year and six months here. I come back here and build up the funds so I can go to Southeast Asia. The places I go, I have to pay my own airfare, my food, my room. I send money ahead for advertising to let them know that the meeting is there. The people in those places have nothing to give. I have three-week crusades in India, and the second or third night of the crusade on the altar will be a bowl of rice that someone brought as an offering for Betty Baxter. And I weep as I take that bowl of rice because that's their normal food, one bowl of rice a day, so someone gave up their food that day to give to me. They bring flowers that are wilty and put on the altar as a gift for me. They have nothing to give. It's been my privilege to be an islet, to go to an island in Indonesia. They'd never heard the name of Jesus. I went to a village in India. They'd never heard his name. 
A lady there said, why didn't someone come a long time before this and tell us about this Jesus? Is it fair that in America we hear it over and over again when there's still some who's never heard it for the first time? I must do what God has asked me to do, and this is what he's asked me to do. I spend three months here, and people give because the American people give to missions more than any other country in the whole world. I build up the fund and go over there, and then I keep having meetings till LaDonna said there's no more money. And then I have to stop traveling and having meetings till I come back to the States. And sometimes it's very frustrating in my spirit, and I pray, Lord, why don't you speak to somebody to monthly support so I could keep on with meetings? So I just came back. And I'm starting meetings again until June. And then in June, I will go back overseas again. And tonight, if God has never asked you to leave America and your children and your grandbabies and go across the sea, will you help send me? The reward will be the same as though you went if I go in your place. Maybe God will speak to some young man or woman tonight. And he will softly whisper in your ear, I want you to be a missionary. Because everywhere I go, I pray, Lord, speak to some young person that they'll take my place. And I can stop going and they'll go in my place. Let him speak to you tonight. It isn't so bad if you know Jesus is with you. The rewards of seeing people come to Jesus Christ and throw their idols away is great and fulfilling. Never known such joy. So be a part in God's kingdom because he's coming very, very soon. The Lord bless you. I appreciate and love you. I'm going to pause and rest just one moment. Don't leave because I'm coming back. It'll only take me a minute to tell you the last words Jesus said to me before he went back in the cloud, and then I'll be praying for the sick. If a little Indian person can give their bowl of brass that day as a gift to Betty Baxter for being there, that's her offering. And if she will go to those places where nobody else will go, and stay just as long as she gets the money, we should be able to give her a something. I hope the Lord deals with some of you tonight to give her a big gift to send her. Hope God calls some of our students to go and go and go and go. The greatest calling in this world when the Lord speaks to you and says, Go for me. Blessed be his holy name. I really like Peter. This is one thing I'd like for you to make a sacrificial gift to do. And I'd like for you to obey him. So would you please bow your head and just say, Oh God, what do you want me to do tonight, Lord? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We must send her, we must send her, we must send her. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Oh, what a precious ministry to the world. <sighs> Thank God for America. That she has a place to come to her. Get the blessings to go back into the dark, dark countries. Mm. And so many crippled people, so many deformed people can come and hear her 
and many of them be made normal. Thank you, Jesus. If you need a blessing tonight, mm. sow some real good seed tonight. I tell you, when you sow a seed in good soil, God gives you a good harvest. <clears throat> Blessed be the name of the Lord God forever. And I promise you will make sure that she gets a check for every penny of this offering. It all goes to Betty Baxter Missions to help take her, to help take her. All I ask you to do tonight is obey the Lord and help send her. Speak to their hearts and that Father in Jesus' name. Let them know, Lord, what you'd be pleased for them to give. Thank you, Lord, that we can send her. Jesus' name. Everybody say, help me, Jesus, to obey you tonight. I want to please you tonight, Lord. In your name, we send Betty. Receive my gift. Thank you, Lord, for accepting my gift. Amen. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. If you like an envelope, hold up your hand. Ushers, quickly. Give the envelopes out quickly if you like an envelope. <clears throat> if the Lord is leading you tonight to give a sacrificial gift, do it. Because he has a blessing for you. He wants to give you. Do it. Obey him. Obey God tonight. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Everybody look toward heaven and say, Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for allowing me to give in your work. And say, Jesus, if there's one person in this building who has nothing to give, I pray that you would bless them. So next time, they'll have something to give. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing me. Make me a blessing, Lord. And make Betty Baxter a blessing to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, ushers. Please receive the gifts tonight in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Is that girl here going to sing for us? T Tiffany? Is this Tiffany? Hello, Tiffany. Tiffany? We've been waiting on you, honey. We called on you once before tonight, but you weren't here. I didn't get off work till late. Oh, bless her, Jesus. Bless her, Lord. I want y'all to know tonight that I count the honor and the privilege to get up here behind this lady. We serve an awesome God. So uh -huh. what Betty is saying to you, there's no reason why you can't receive from the Lord. Jesus paid the price for you to have it all. I read you that scripture, didn't I? I know every beast of the field. I know all the cattle. I know all the fowls of the air. 
I have it all. And I want to give it to you. And you can have it. If you look to me and thank me for it. That's the first step. Thank me for it. And I believe that you've shown Jesus by your love tonight. Of listening real close. And by your giving. That you appreciate what the Lord has sent in our midst. Blessed be God forevermore. Thank you, Jesus. Stay till the end if you can. If you have a little children, I understand. It is time now for the Holy Spirit to minister. Now listen to what Betty has to say to you. And she wants to pray for you in Jesus' name. Thank you for the lovely love offering. It helps me keep me on the field telling this story. And every time I've come here, the Bible school has been so generous with me and given so great. And some of you gave sacrificially tonight, and I'm going to pray that God will abundantly bless you and give it back to you many times more. Someday when we get to heaven, the rewards are handed out. If he calls my name to reward me for souls I've won, I'll receive nothing till he's called your name to stand beside me. You now have a share in all the souls I win for Jesus. I could not go unless you sent me. God bless you. And in the days that follow tonight, don't forget about me. Just keep praying that God will give me strength to keep on doing what he's called me to do. And someday we're going to see him face to face. And I believe it's very, very soon. I didn't want to close until I told you what to me is the greatest part of the whole story. If you forget all the rest of it, always remember this part. As I stood there straight, healed by God's power, looked back at the empty chair where I'd been sitting, and Jesus was still standing beside the chair. His arms outstretched toward me. He looked slowly from the soles of my feet to the top of my head. When I saw him looking at me, I stood as straight as I could so he could see how good he made me. I believe he stayed to enjoy his handiwork, don't you? And then Jesus looked deep into my eyes and spoke these words I shall never forget. Betty, I've given you the desire of your heart. I've healed you completely and made you whole. And I nodded my head because I knew he had. Still looking at me smiling, he said, but I've got to leave you here for a little while. I'm going back to the Father and finish that mansion that's almost ready for you. I want you to go out and tell the world what I've done for you. When men and women hear this story, they'll be saved. And when they hear this story, they'll be healed and brought to God. And smiling just before he backed to the cloud and went away, he smiled and said, And be thou faithful. And every day watch for a cloud. And the next time you see me coming in a cloud, I'm not going to leave you here but I'm going to take you to be with me forevermore. He's coming back again. He said he was. Jesus Christ is coming back to earth again. And since that day he healed me, day after day, I look for him to return for me. And someday I'm going to see him come back. He's coming back for those who love him, for those whose sins have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And oh, how I long today, tonight when she sang that, that uh, song, could, wasn't you just lifted up in the heavenlies to think that someday you're going to walk on streets of gold. Someday we'll be forever with the Lord. Hallelujah. Just think if Jesus would come tonight, you wouldn't have to get up in the work and go to work in the morning. If he'd come, there'd be no more rent to pay, no more car payments. Just think of how great it would be to be forever with the Lord. That's right. To be forever with the Lord. Hallelujah. But he's coming for those that are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I'm going to ask musicians to come real fast and while every head is bowed and every eye closed. Jesus spoke to me after he healed me and said, every time you tell your story, Ask those who don't know me, give them an opportunity to accept me as Savior and then pray for the sick. And so I'm sure that nearly every one of you tonight know Jesus as your Savior and you're ready should he come tonight. But if there should be one sitting here that has unconfessed sin in your life, then you'd miss heaven. He's coming for a people where their robes are pure and spotless, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Sin cannot enter there. 
There's no great or small sin with God. Sin is sin. If you have unforgiveness, unconfessed sin in your life and you know what you realize tonight and you're sitting there saying Betty I don't know Jesus like you know him I'm not sure if you'd see the cloud I'm ready just pray for me I'm going to give this opportunity for I pray for the sick is there one just slip up your hand maybe there's a young person tonight you've once known Jesus you still pretend but inside you have nothing just slip up your hand because Jesus sees your heart tonight is there anyone I won't tell you. I'm just giving you an opportunity. Very well. Everyone stand, please. We've kept you seated a long time. And we're going to pray for those that are sick tonight. I cannot heal. If I could, I'd empty the hospitals. But there's one here tonight who does heal. And I want you to come when I call your section and make one long line across the front. Don't get behind anyone because sometimes the power of God comes on a person they fall. I don't want anybody back in your workers. Get very close beside each other. But anyone that needs healing in these two sections tonight, would you just come and stand here and leave room for me to come by in front of you. Quickly, real fast, so I can see how many I can call. All right. Come very quickly. Stand real close together, but don't get behind anyone. Leave room for me to pass by. I'm going to ask Brother Hayes to come. I'm going to ask uh, uh, May and the two ladies that have been speaking on faith and healing, would you come and just stand here in front too? Uh, Emily is the, and, and Nikki, just come and stand right here in front with me because they're going to agree. The Bible says if any two or three agree is touching one thing, it'll be done.